Welcome to the History of the Arezzo Family, Part 2. As you recall in Part 1, we went back 100 years to 1920 and focused on Giuseppe and Agatha Arezzo of Ragusa and their eight children, affectionately referred to as the siblings, one of which was my mother, Maria. We saw how after Agatha's untimely death, Giuseppe and the siblings left Sicily in the 1920s in two separate voyages and journeyed to a new country, America, settling in Brooklyn. We explored what it was like for them putting down roots, growing up in America, surviving war and the Depression, and starting families of their own. For part two, we're going to go back almost 900 years to the year 1130, where a pair of siblings, Aldo and Umberto, also journeyed to a new land and into an uncertain future. They were the Arezzo's oldest known ancestors on the island of Sicily. Aldo had a son, Alderecio, who in turn had three sons, Umberto, Aldo, and Andriolo. And they established one of the oldest noble aristocratic families in Sicily, the Arezzo family. A family which splintered into many branches and whose members achieved positions of prominence in the realms of government, politics, religion, and the military throughout Sicily, but mainly in Syracuse, Ragusa, and Palermo. Well, you heard me say that the Arezzo family was an aristocratic family, a noble family, and maybe this is a good time to explain exactly what is meant by that and how that came to be. The aristocratic classes in feudal Sicily, as well as most of Europe, were the landholders in a society where land was the greatest source and measure of wealth. And I use the term landholders and not landowners because in a feudal society, the king owns all the land, which he would then bestow to individuals in return for fealty and military service. These parcels of land were known as fiefs, came in all sizes, big and small, and were heritable in that they passed down from father to son. It is most probable that Aldo and Umberto, who were knights for King Roger II, were awarded land estates for their loyalty and service to the crown. And with that, Aldo and Umberto established the Arezzo family into Sicilian nobility, where they would grow and prosper for the next 900 years and have a presence in every possible niche of Sicilian high society. We also know that Umberto's son, Alderecio, served Kings William I and II, and that Alderecio's grandchildren, Alberto and Ruggiero, served King Frederick I. Again, I am quite sure that they were all duly rewarded for their services with grants of additional land, which were passed on to their descendants. By the 14th century, this class of landholders came to be known as the, the Baroni, the Barons, and their feudal lands as Baronies. And this is when we first see members of the Arezzo family with the title and rank of Baron and the use of the family coat of arms. These Baronies were very autonomous, and operated like many kingdoms, with the barons being able to exercise great power and authority without much of a check from Palermo. The title, land, and obligations of a baron were hereditary, and upon a baron's death, his oldest male child would formally be invested as the new baron. But if there were no male heirs, on the Sicilian law, the oldest female child would then inherit the barony. This rule of inheritance will come into play a number of times for the Arezzo family in important ways. So what of the uh, other children of a baron that were not in line to inherit? Well, the younger males often became knights and could serve in military orders such as the Knights of Malta, as many Arezzos did, often reaching high positions within the order. Or they could be granted fiefs of their own by pledging fealty and service to a lord. Or they could pursue other interests that their privileged birth afforded them in the arts or government or even the church. And the females? Well, as women, they had fewer options, other than marrying well. So it was a bit of a surprise that in doing my research, I found that two of the more prominent Arezzo family members happened to be female, and they both left their indelible mark on Sicily in a way that I don't think any male family member has. Maria Scanina, or as she's also known by her religious name, Maria of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, was born into a wealthy and noble family of Ragusa, but she gave up her comfortable life of luxury to become a Roman Catholic nun and dedicate herself to those less fortunate 
that she often observed steps from the very palace that she grew up in. In 1889, upon the urging and encouragement of the Archbishop of Siragusa, Maria with five other nuns founded the Sisters of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. The order was solely committed to serving the material and spiritual needs of the destitute, the sick, and the abandoned children of Ragusa. Her dedication, hard work, and charisma gained her a following of adherents that saw her as a role model and a leader for the true social revolution. The Sisters of the Sacred Heart progressively expanded throughout Sicily and other regions of Italy, and in 1908 they were active in caring for the many that had been afflicted by the great earthquake and tsunami that devastated Messina. Today, the Sisters of the Sacred Heart can be found still carrying out her work in three continents and many countries, including the United States and Canada. The process of Maria's beatification, which is the last step right before sainthood, began in Ragusa in 1937, and again a decade later in 1956. But it was in 1989, after years of investigation by the Catholic Church and medical boards, that it was concluded that the unexplainable medical recovery of a woman in severe respiratory failure was in fact a miracle attributed to Maria. And a year later, on November 4, 1990, Pope Paul II presided over a ceremony in St. Peter's Square that Maria was beatified and awarded the title of blessed. Well, another female ancestor that has left her indelible mark on Ragusa is Maria Paterno Arezzo, or as she was also known, the Princess of Castellacci. Maria was born in Catania in 1869. She was the younger of two daughters. Her father was Giuseppe Maria Paterno, Duke of Palazzo and the fifth Prince of Sparlinga. Her mother was Vincenzina Arezzo of the Barons of Donna Fogata. Vincenzina married the Duke when she was only 16 years old, but the marriage didn't go well and she and her two daughters were abandoned by the Duke, who left to live with another woman. Vincenzina fell into a depression, her health deteriorated, and she was no longer able to care for her two daughters. She died alone in Paris in 1888. Maria and Clementina moved to Ragusa to live with and be cared for by their grandparents, Corrado and Conchetta, who raised them as their own. Corrado was a fascinating person, and we'll have more about him a little later in this video. But he was most known for restoring the Danafogata Castle, and of being a true Renaissance man, a politician, poet, musician, artist, and philanthropist. A man who surrounded himself with intellectuals, authors, and artists. So it was in this environment where Maria grew to love the arts, but who also understood her responsibility to help those less fortunate than herself. In 1889, at the age of 19, Marie married Francesco Marullo Balsamo, Prince of Castellacci, and scion of one of the most prestigious families of Messina. And after the wedding, Maria reluctantly moved to that fated city, leaving her grandparents and her beloved Ragusa behind. Marie and her husband tragically died under the rubble of their home, which was devastated by the 1908 earthquake. The city was so devastated that it took months until their home was excavated and their bodies recovered. But also recovered in the rubble was Maria's last will and testament, dated February 8, 1900, which bequeathed a huge portion of her fortune to the construction and ongoing maintenance of a hospital reserved for the poor and needy of Ragusa. And after the many legal disputes regarding her will were settled, construction began in 1914 in the open countryside just across from Ragusa Ibla. And on January 28, 1923, the hospital Maria Paterno Arezzo was inaugurated and has been in operation ever since. In 2008, the 100th anniversary of Maria's death, the city of Ragusa commemorated her life with a series of touching events. And by some accounts, the most moving was the playing of the music from Aida, the opera that had played in the Opera House of Messina just hours before the devastating earthquake. The celebrations were testament that Ragusa 
had not forgotten its unfortunate and generous daughter. Okay, so let's travel back in time and take a look at some of our ancestors along the way. And as we move along in the upper left-hand corner, you will see an image of the monarch that was ruling over Sicily at that particular point in time. There were 41 in all. Here we see them starting with King Roger II, who coincidentally was coronated the first king of Sicily the very year that Aldo arrived on the island in 1130. To the last monarch, King Francis or Francesco II, just before Sicily merged into the newly formed Kingdom of Italy in 1861. So we'll start with the siblings, and to their immediate right, Giuseppe and Agatha. And as we go one more generation back, we see Giuseppe's parents, Giorgio and Concetta Lupes. As you recall, Giuseppe was one of 11 children born to Concetta, who he might add was also of noble birth, having descended from the ancient Lupus family, or House of Wolves, as they were called. Sounds a little bit like the Game of Thrones, doesn't it? We don't know much about Giorgio other than he was the last born of eight children of Baron Carmelo Carrado and Ignazia Tomasa Martina, as you can see here. Giorgio's oldest brother was Domenico, who gained some notoriety by creating some of the first daguerreotypes in Italy. A daguerreotype was a type of photographic process that predated modern photography. As a matter of fact, one of his famous images was that of his soon-to-be wife, Maria, and which you can see here gracing the covers of a magazine on the history of the daguerreotype in Italy. By the way, if you have been paying attention, we have had three succeeding generations with eight, eleven, and nine children. If nothing else, the Arezzos certainly were prolific. Okay, back to the timeline. Okay, we need to stop here for a second because we have a couple things going on. First, we have the Trifoletti branch of the family moving from Syracuse to Ragusa. Records indicate that Domenico was born in Syracuse but married a girl from Ragusa, Concetta Sortino Casa, and from thenceforward the Trifoletti branch was associated with Ragusa, as can be seen by the many Arezzo palaces and homes scattered throughout this ancient and beautiful city. Oh, and one interesting fact was that Conchetta died at age 31 after having had 10 children. 10. The second thing I want to bring to your attention is the actual genesis of the Trifoletti branch. As I've previously mentioned, there are many different branches of the family that have emerged over the centuries, usually as an outgrowth of the common practice of intermarrying with other noble families and as a result, incorporating their land, fiefs, inheritances, and titles. And that's exactly what happened when Gaetano Arezzo married Eleonora di Trifoletti, who happened to be the Baronessa of the di Trifoletti family. She was one of three daughters of Baroni Domenico Prado di Trifoletti, and as there were no male heirs, she got the title, inheritance, and lands belonging to the di Trifoletti family. Not only was it common for there to be intermarriage among noble families, there was also a lot of intermarriage within families. Let me give you a couple of examples. First, we have Giuseppe and Agatha, my grandparents. And as you recall, Giuseppe's parents were Giorgio and Concetta. And Giorgio's parents were the Baron Carmelo and Inazia. In addition to Giorgio, the Baron and Inazia had seven other children, including Agatha. Agatha married the Baron of Di San Filippo Fief and produced a daughter, Rosalia Maria, who was Agatha's mother. That would make Giuseppe and Agatha first cousins once removed. Let me give you another example. Here is Domenico and his wife Maria that we discussed earlier. Not only was she his wife, but she was also his first cousin. His father and her mother were brother and sister. They were both the offspring of Domenico, the very same that moved from Syracuse to Ragusa. But if you look closely at some of the other lineages, you will often see that there are rezos on both sides of the marital unions. Well, except for the Marchese here, he married an Anna Fitzgerald from Dublin, Ireland of all places. We'll be talking more about the Marchese a little later in this video, as he is a prominent figure in the Arezzo family. Okay, back to the timeline. And as we go back in time, you can see that we have a succession of barons in this lineage, 
the barons of Tajia, passed down from father to son. Okay, let's stop here a moment to note a couple of things. Here we have the first appearance of the Arezzo surname as, as we know it today. And if you're interested in learning more about the possible origins of the Arezzo name as well as the family coat of arms, I have a, another video on the subject and I'll provide a link in the description below. But we also can see how the Targier barony came into the possession of the Arezzo family, where it would, would remain for the next 350 years. Tarja was an important fief just out of, outside of Siragusa, one that was often described as being both vast and fertile. Tarja had been the summer playground for King and Holy Roman Emperor Frederick II, who in the early 13th century built his Castello del Solosium. Solosium, Latin for comfort, relief, solace, he used to come here for hunting, relaxation, and the beautiful vistas as did many others in the royal and aristocratic classes of their time. Think of it as a medieval Hamptons of Sicily. This viable land was ultimately given by King Frederick to loyal Syracusan farmers, and it passed through several noble families until the title and inheritance was invested in the Galgana family, and ultimately to a Baron Francesco Galgana. Francesco had two children, Giovanni, and Beatrice, no, not the Italian pronunciation, but it's the best you're going to get from me. Beatrice married Arigio Arezzo, who was the Baron of Cardinale and Benali, two of the first fiefs possessed by the Arezzos. And when Beatrice's brother died childless in the mid-1500s, the Targia barony was added to the Arezzo family's vast holdings in and around Siragusa. Of course, the Arezzos had their palaces in the city, here are just two of them, but they used King Ferdinand's castle for centuries as a central location to manage their land holdings in the area. The marriage of Arigio and Beatrice initiated 350 years of Arezzo barons of Tarsia. This string of barons came to an end in 1908 when the last Arezzo baron of Tarsia, John Battista Arezzo, sold the land to the Papilo family, where they operate a winery to this very day. Okay, well, before we leave this time period, I'd like to highlight a couple more Rezo ancestors that achieved some historical prominence. First, we have Arigio and Beatrice's second child, Claudio Mario, born in the year 1500. He is considered one of the greatest Renaissance humanists in Sicily of that century. He was an author, linguist, poet, geographer, archaeologist, diplomat, and perhaps most noteworthy, the imperial historian, and some say advisor and confidant to King Charles V. He captured King Charles' attention through his frequent writings on the Italian Wars, which were a series of conflicts for control of Italy by Spain and France, as well as other European states. One of those writings was his 1520 essay, Sicily to Charles, which was a moving invocation in Latin to Charles to intervene and restore peace to the island torn apart by bloody factional struggles. He was appointed court historiographer in 1525 and in 1530 attended the crowning of Charles as Holy Roman Emperor by Pope Clement VII in Bologna, Italy. Claudio followed Charles to the imperial court in Augsburg, Germany where he often played the role of intermediary between the various opposing factions at the imperial court, always the peacemaker. He served Charles until 1532, at which time he returned to Sicily, residing in Messina for the rest of his life. But Claudio was known for more than his service to King Charles. His most noted work was the first attempt at a complete geographical description of Sicily. It was also written in Latin, and its title roughly translated was The Situation of the Island of Sicily. But it was so much more than just a mere description of the island's geographic features. It also incorporated extensive references to the flora and fauna, economic resources, conditions of agriculture, local industries, legends, and ancient runes. 
It was sprinkled with historical references of Sicily, from Cicero and Thucydides. It was enormously successful and has been reprinted many times over the centuries. You can even pick it up on Amazon. Here's one of the earliest volumes. The exact date is unknown, but experts say the binding is of 17th century origin. He also wrote a renowned book on Sicilian grammar, but like all things with Claudio, it was so much more than that, as it was simultaneously a forceful political argument for the establishment of a Sicilian national identity, as can be seen by this seminar on the subject at the Renaissance Society of America's 2020 National Convention, nearly 450 years after his death. So let's move from the son of the first Arezzo Baron of Tasia to a son of the last Baron of Tasia, Commander Gaetano Arezzo della Tasia. Gaetano was a naval officer. One of the first assignments he had was on the submarine Medusa, which suffered a torpedo attack on January 30th, 1942. Lieutenant Arezzo, although suffering injuries to his foot, shoulder, and eye, was one of only two survivors. Gaetano did not wait for a complete convalescence, but requested and obtained a new assignment, this time aboard the submarine Yurashik. Here is some footage of the inauguration of that ship in 1942. He was commissioned as commander of the submarine and engaged in 15 missions, one of which earned him the silver medal. But on December 15, 1942, Gaetano's submarine came under a withering attack by enemy units. The submarine was forced to service, and Commander Arezzo was fatally struck by a machine gun fire as he reached his battle post in the turret to take command of the surface battle. The final toll for the Yurashik crew was 17 dead and 30 survivors. Gaetano earned two silver and one bronze medal for military valor and is remembered to this day by having his Maritime High School, as well as the Naval Academy of Logistics, named in his honor. He even has a street in Siragusa that bears his name. Gitano Arezzo della Tagia, 1911-1942. Okay, back to the timeline. Let's pause here just for a moment and point out how the Arezzo family once again acquired a new barony through marriage this time due to the marriage of Maria La Balina, the Baronessa di Benali, and Giovanni. Okay, let's continue. And as we go further back in time, you can see some of the various spellings of the family surname. There were many, prior to Arezzo being standardized in the 15th century. And if we go even further back, there are no surnames at all, just names like Ruggiero, son of Aldo, Aldo, son of Aldoresio, etc., until we finally get to Aldo, the Arezzo's oldest known ancestor on the island of Sicily. And if we pull back, we can see we traced a direct line from the siblings to Aldo, 25 generations by my count. And you must remember that this is just one strand of many branches of the substantial Arezzo family, a portion of which is depicted here. And in red is the strand we just traveled from Giorgio, the sibling's grandfather, to Aldo. Let's take an opportunity to look at this chart again and mark those Arezzo's with noble titles. There were 60 barons by my count, six with the title of Duke, and six Marcheses. And this is where we find our next prominent Arezzo, the Marchese Orazio Arezzo. Orazio was born in 1709 in Modica. His father and grandfather were both governors of the county of Modica, but Orazio didn't follow in their footsteps. Instead, he became a military man. And in August of 1744, Colonel Orazio found himself fighting at the Battle of Velletri, which was a battle in the War of Austrian Succession between Austria and the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies. And in that battle, it is reported that Orazio saved the life of King Charles III. As one account put it, in the Battle of Velletri, Arezzo, fighting close to the king during the melee, noticed a deadly and unexpected enemy blow 
that was about to kill Charles and rushed with lightning speed to shield him and save his life. Horatio was immediately promoted to Brigadier General. It would seem that saving the king's life has its advantages. Four years later, in 1748, Charles bestowed the title of Marchese on Horatio and his gold key, symbolizing unrestricted access to the royal palace. Horatio served the crown for the rest of his rather long life, he lived to 86, in both military and civil capacities. He could see some of the titles he held. I have no idea what most of them mean, but they sure sound important. One of those early assignments was in 1755, when Orazio was appointed general commander of the garrison at Orbitello. Orbitello was not in the kingdom per se, but was actually a protectorate in Tuscany, and was positioned militarily to hold off any possible Austrian aggression. Orazio was married at the time to a Mary Anna Fitzgerald of the Dukes of Leinster, which was the premier dukedom in Ireland at the time. Some in the Arezzo family are convinced she is a direct blood ancestor to John F. Kennedy, but I haven't seen documentation supporting that as of yet. I did find out, however, that JFK is my 20th cousin through another Arezzo lineage. In 1759, the King of Spain, Ferdinand VI, died, and King Charles, his half-brother, succeeded him, leaving the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies to his third son, Ferdinand, who was just nine years old at the time. Charles, wanting his son to have the influence of a great military man like Orazio, whom Charles had great admiration for, had Orazio and his growing family returned to Naples in the opposing Castello Nuovo. In addition to being a man of action, Orazio was also a man of compassion and social responsibility. In 1764, when Naples was suffering a great famine and deadly typhus epidemic, Orazio ordered and oversaw the building of a number of temporary hospitals to serve the citizens without regard to social class, wealth, or religious creed. His hospitals were credited with saving hundreds of lives. Some have speculated that he served as a role model for future generations of Arezzo's, imbuing that sense of altruism and social responsibility we so often see. It's no surprise that when Orazio's death was announced with this notice, on the evening of January 30th, 1796, large crowds gathered for several nights at the Castello Nuovo, holding hundreds of candles out of respect for the greatly admired Marchese Orazio Rezzo. 1709-1796. Orazio had eight children. His oldest was Ramondo Maria Isidoro, and like his father, he was a military man, a colonel leading the Mesopia Regiment, and is said to have distinguished himself in the 1793 at the Siege of Toulon, a battle which coincidentally won fame and promotion for a young Napoleon Bonaparte. Romando was killed in the same campaign against the French in the Battle of Soro in 1797. Romando was 41 years old. That would have meant the title and inheritance going to the second male child, Tommaso. But Tommaso, at the time of his father's death, was a Roman Catholic priest and turned down the title. Tommaso would go on to be a cardinal and one that played a not insignificant role in the history of the time. We'll have more to say about Tommaso in a bit. That meant the title of Marchese fell to Orazio and Maria's third son, Giuseppe, and his descendants. Orazio also had four daughters, and they all married into prominent noble families. Anna Maria married the Baron of Bandifi. Maria Teresa married the Duke of San Clemente. Elisabetta married the Count of Solana, and after the death of her husband in 1816, inherited the bulk of his property, including this storybook castle. Being childless when she died in 1825, her wealth then passed to her brothers, Giuseppe and Claudio. Eventually, the Solano properties ended up with Giuseppe's son, Orazio, who became the Count of Solano. And Orazio's youngest daughter, Isabella, married another duke. But let's get back to Maria Teresa for a moment, because hers is an interesting story. 
As I mentioned before, she was forced at age 15 to marry the Duke of San Clemente. And she went with him to Florence to live in his palace in San Clemente. Their marriage failed, however, and the two children she had with the Duke were taken away from her. At age 26, she returned to Naples. She was soon appointed as lady-in-waiting to Queen Maria Carolina. Maria Carolina was the wife of King Ferdinand, who, as you will recall, ascended the throne as a young boy. But he grew up disinterested and, some say, incapable of ruling as sovereign, a role his wife, Maria, was most happy to fill. Maria Carolina was the de facto ruler and queen of the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies from 1778 to 1805, at which time Napoleon installed his brother on the throne. At a certain point, Maria Theresa became a close friend and confidant of the queen, as they were both enamored of the Enlightenment movement that was sweeping Europe. The palace became the center of intellectual debate regarding the nature of government, monarchies, divine right, etc. The queen, however, lost interest in this somewhat revolutionary talk when her sister, Marie Antoinette, was beheaded. Maria Theresa did not lose interest, however, She only became more fervent in her support of the Republican movement, both financially and with her speeches. By all accounts, Maria Theresa was a brilliant speaker, charismatic, and always the center of whatever group she was in. In 1799, the Republicans actually gained control of Naples with the assist of an approaching French army. The royal family fled to Sicily, and for one year Naples was under the control of the Republicans, which Maria Theresa very much supported. Unfortunately, when Naples was retaken by King Ferdinand a year later, Maria Theresa was arrested and imprisoned. It is suggested that she only escaped execution because she was the daughter of Orazio. She instead was exiled from the kingdom. It is said that Orazio decreed that no one in the family was to ever communicate with his daughter. She became persona non grata for the Arezzo family. Now, Maria Theresa's brother, Tommaso, has a very different story to tell. Though Leopoldo Arezzo was born in the year 1756 in Orbitello during the period when his father, the Marchese, was general commander of the garrison. I only mention this fact because it will play some importance later on in our story. As a boy, Tommaso studied at the prestigious College of the Nazareno in Rome, a school which was noted for its focus on classical literature. In 1777, Tommaso entered an ecclesiastical college to study civil and canonical law and was ordained a priest in 1779. He served the next 19 years in various capacities for the Catholic Church throughout Italy. And in 1798, Tommaso returned to Sicily where he had large land holdings Whether to retire or just for a brief respite is unclear, but he was soon called back to Rome and in 1802 was appointed Archbishop. He was first sent to Russia as the Pope's personal envoy on a mission of rapprochement with the Orthodox Church, and then was entrusted with diplomatic missions in St. Petersburg and Dresden. In 1807, while in Dresden, Tommaso received an invitation for a meeting in Berlin from Napoleon, who had been swallowing up big chunks of Europe at this time. Napoleon wanted Tommaso to act as an intermediary to try and convince Pope Pius VII and the Roman Catholic Church to join the continental blockade against England. It was a doomed request from the start, as the Pope never had any intention of joining the blockade. A year later, in 1808, Napoleon's army marched into Rome, and Tommaso, the Pope, and many other high-ranking clergy members were arrested and eventually exiled to Bastia on the French island of Corsica. In Bastia, Tommaso was able to enjoy relative freedom while being under a sort of house arrest, although he was always guarded by French soldiers. But on May 4, 1812, Napoleon issued an imperial decree that all subjects of the empire, including the clergy, were required to swear an oath of allegiance. Tommaso argued that he was a Sicilian and therefore not subject of the French empire. They reminded him, however, 
that he was born in Orbitello in Tuscany, which had been incorporated into the empire as of 1801 and as such would be required to take the oath or suffer the consequences. Tommaso was tormented by the decision he had to make, and he wrote about his thought process. They want me to take an oath of allegiance to Napoleon? Well, I give it, let's assume for a moment what happens. I'm a lost man. My possessions are confiscated. I betray my conscience. I lose my homeland, my honor, my friends. I expose my family. I remain a worm, naked, despised, disheartened. Or not to take the oath. I am thrown into the depths of a dark prison, tormented like my companions, and exposed to lose my life amidst hardship if a decree of execution does not shorten my days. Was a law ever intended which puts man at the cruel crossroads, which in whatever way it is decided goes towards certain ruin? Could Caligula, Nero, Domitian, Maximin conceive of a more atrocious one? He refused to take the oath and was promptly taken to the Citadella di Corte to endure a much harsher confinement, or as he described it, a sad hovel with dirty walls and poorly connected beams and barely a few square feet large, with no furniture, no shutters on the windows, and overlooking a rocky outcrop. Until he escaped, that is. Tommaso's escape was documented in his book, Mia Fuga da Corsica, My Escape from Corsica, which was published in 1903, and which describes in detail his escape, not only from the citadel, but from the French-controlled island of Corsica. It is such a gripping story that they are still writing about it 200 years later. Here are two recent articles about the Bishop Tommaso's adventures. Tommaso had a few things in his favor that helped him plan his escape. He had important friends in Corsica willing to help, including the mayor. He also had the local population that did not particularly care for the French. And he had money. Lots of it. So on the evening of November 20th, 1812... Tommaso disguised himself as a peasant, wearing a thick woolen coat, and he walked right out the front gate, perhaps aided with the spreading of some well-placed bribes. He was met at the Corte Bridge by the escorts arranged by his Corsican friends, as well as some horses, to take him to the Omesa convent, where he could be safe, for the time being. They soon learned that the French commander was furious at his escape, and had his sentries lashed. He ordered his soldiers and gendarmes to span out in all directions and to search every home in Corte to find Tommaso and bring him back, dead or alive. Staying at the convent was no longer safe, and after three days Tommaso moved on to a number of safe houses before making the long and arduous journey over mountainous terrain to the coast where a boat would be waiting for him, all the while trying to avoid the main roads and French patrols. Eventually they arrived at Bastia, and Tommaso stayed at another safe house until his planned departure on December 27th. And at 9 p.m. at night, he donned his woolen cloak once again and made his way to a small cove avoiding the ever-present French patrols and boarded a boat with seven sailors and took off for Sardinia. Even this journey was fraught with peril, as the boat almost capsized a number of times while negotiating the currents in the strait of Bonifacio. But on December 30th, he landed on the island of La Maddalena, and from there made his way down to the Palazzo Reggio to meet with the King of Sardina, Victor Emmanuel I, who along with the rest of the royal court was captivated with Tommaso's daring escape. The story of a hero priest that bested Napoleon soon became widespread, most likely assisted by the Savoy court that wished to arouse the people against the French. In April of 1814, Napoleon was forced to abdicate the throne after his crushing defeat in Russia. The borders of Europe were set back to pre-Empire days, and Napoleon was exiled to the island of Elba. Tommaso embarked with Victor Emmanuel to Genoa to meet Pope Pius VII and returned with him triumphantly to Rome. Two years later, in 1816, he was appointed cardinal and was ultimately assigned as the Pope's ambassador to the city of Ferrara, a role he served for 14 years. Cardinal Tommaso Arezzo died on February 3, 1833, at the age of 76. 
His funeral was presided over by Pope Gregory XVI and was held in the Basilica of San Lorenzo in Rome, where he was also buried. Cardinal Tommaso Maria Ramando Leopoldo Rezzo, 1756-1833. Okay, I want to tell you about just one more prominent Arezzo, and that is Corrado Arezzo di Spucci's, who was the ninth baron of Donna Fugata. Ending with Corrado would seem appropriate, as he thrived at a time when feudalism and the aristocratic way of life was coming to an end. It was also a turbulent time in Sicily, with numerous rebellions and revolts against the Bourbon monarchy, and Corrado was smack dab in the middle of it all. But first, a little history. The Donna Fagata fiefdom, which is nine miles west of Ragusa, belonged to the crown until the 15th century when it passed to the Cabrera family, who then sold it in the 1600s to Giovanni Arezzo, who became the first baron of Donna Fagata. There was a 14th century watchtower on the land where the Arezzo family decided to build a summer home to better manage their agricultural interests. And over the years, the Arezzo home was added to, but it was Corrado, the ninth baron, which added on the neo-Gothic and neoclassical structures to transform a summer home to what is now known as the 122-room Donna Fogata Castle. Corrado was the first son of Francesco and Vincenzo di Spucci's and was born in Ragusa on November 7th, 1824. He was well-educated in the arts and could speak French, English, and German in addition to his native Italian. In 1848, when Corrado was 23 years old, Europe was in the throes of numerous rebellions and insurrections against the ruling monarchies. Corrado was very much part of this movement, and he founded and directed an anti-Bourbon satirical newspaper, El Gatto, a role which earned him much harassment and prosecution from the authorities. But in January of 1848, the revolution succeeded and resulted in an independent state for 16 months. And during those 16 months, Corrado served as the representative of Ragusa as a senator in the general parliament. And though this new state lasted only 16 months, the liberal constitution that survived led to the eventual end of the Bourbon rule and Italian unification in 1860. After the reunification, Corrado held a number of positions. Governor of Nodo, Governor of Trapani, Deputy of the Kingdom of Italy, Senator of the Kingdom, President of the Province of Syracuse, and ultimately Mayor of Ragusa. From 1860 to 1890, he was considered the most important politician in southeastern Sicily. He did have his detractors, however. He received much criticism for using his power and influence to have the construction of the Siragusa Jela Railroad diverted to pass right by his castle instead of the originally intended Santa Croce. Needless to say, the residents of Santa Croce were none too pleased. He was also put on trial at one point for having the audacity to criticize King Victorio Emmanuel, the new government of United Italy, and the Piedmontese army. The somewhat notorious trial and the events surrounding it were the subject of a book, El Processo, by Mimi Arezzo. But in addition to his political life, Corrado was a man of great culture and refinement. He was a botanist, a painter, a poet. His volume of verses, The Harmony, was highly praised by critics of the time. He filled the Donna Fogata castle with great works of art and his gardens with exotic specimens from around the world. The castle became a center for intellectuals and artists of the time. Corrado, like many Arezzo's, was also a philanthropist. It is said that there's a whole street in Ragusa of homes that Corrado provided to orphans upon their marriage. And in the winter of 1893, when a severe drought and famine gripped Sicily, he distributed over a thousand soups a day to the needy for two months. And towards the end of his life, he had plans to build a municipal hospital for the poor, but he passed away before the project could get started. I don't think it's a coincidence that his granddaughter, Maria Paterno Arezzo, 
ended up completing this last dream. Corrado spent the last years of his life in the castle and died on December 27, 1895, at the age of 71. Corrado Arezzo de Spuches, 9th Baron of Donna Fogata, 1824-1895. Well, we looked at a number of members of the Arezzo family that left their mark on the history of their times, but we've only scratched the surface of the Arezzo family's contributions to Sicily. Just looking through these charts gives one an idea of how many Arezzo family members played a role over the years. For example, in this book of Noble Sicily by the historian Marchese Villablanca, he lists all the official positions held by illustrious citizens in Siragusa from 1398 to 1758. The number of Arezzo's listed is nothing short of astonishing. So when I started this project and learned of the aristocratic nature of the family, I had mixed feelings. The fact that they were part of the 1% of their time, was that something to be proud of or something to be ashamed of? But the more I researched and learned about the lives of some of my ancestors, I realized that that was the wrong question to ask. The question should be, is what they did with the privilege that was handed to them through a system not of their making? And time and time again, I was heartened to see how many showed great generosities to the less fortunate. How some fought for a more liberal governance despite their privileged positions and at great personal risk. Or those that were fierce and effective advocates for peace in a time racked by conflict and some demonstrated extraordinary courage on the fire and paid the ultimate price for their service. It makes me look at this 1907 photo of the Arezzo family in Ragusa in a whole new light. Because when I look at their faces now, I get a little glimpse of the 900 years of history that are behind those faces, as well as my own. I just want to take a moment to acknowledge those that did the hard work of doing the research into the Arezzo family and whom I depended on in making this video. The earliest historian that wrote about the Arezzo family was a Philadelphius Mungus. His three volumes on the noble families of Sicily were written between 1647 and 1670. He was followed by a number of other historians over the centuries. But it wasn't until Eugenio Sortino Trano, an Arezzo by marriage, who in the early 20th century, who really documented the entire Arezzo family history. His research was the basis for Domenico Arezzo, who created these incredibly beautiful charts of the Arezzo family tree that I have used liberally throughout this video. Another Arezzo historian is Gaetano Arezzo di Trifoletti, who put together this comprehensive history of the Arezzo family, which was an invaluable resource. I also want to give a special thanks to Michelangelo Arezzo di Trifoletti, who wrote a fantastic novel, The Seal of the Family, A Rediscovered Past, centered around the protagonist discovering his Arezzo family history. It was his book and my conversations with Michelangelo that brought my ancestors alive in a way that Wikipedia never could. The book is only in Italian at this point, but Michelangelo is in the process of having it translated into English, and when it is available, I highly recommend it. And finally, a special thanks to my brother Byrne. Not only for his tremendous amount of work he put into having the entire Arezzo genealogy entered into Genie.com so that we can all explore our ancestors, but also for his guidance in making of this video. He was my fact checker, but more importantly, he offered valuable suggestions and critiques, which made this video quite a bit better than it otherwise would have been. Oh, and as a final bonus, due to the fact that aristocratic families intermarried with other aristocratic or royal families, those of us that are Arezzos have direct blood relatives to some interesting people. Thanks for watching.